Welcome to the Panzer Museum Munster, and today we look at probably the most important German anti-tank gun of the Second World War. The 7,5 cm Panzerjäger Kanone 40. And for this, we combine the best of both worlds, primary sources and a museum piece. Well, why was this the most important German anti-tank gun of the Second World War? First, it was the most produced German anti-tank gun during the war. Second, it was able to destroy most Allied tanks even at the end of the war. As such, this weapon was the backbone of the German anti-tank defenses, especially for the infantry divisions from 1943 onwards. It was already introduced in 1942, yet in small numbers. According to Hahn, a total of 23,303 of these guns were produced. But another source notes that these numbers are too high, as such the numbers are more likely at around 20,000. To put this in contrast with the next larger anti-tank gun, namely the 8.8 cm Pak 43-41 and Pak 43 together, we have 3,501 that were produced according to Hahn. Now it's time to look at the gun itself. Let us begin at the tip of the spear with the muzzle brake. Now, it was not allowed to fire with a damaged muzzle brake. And you could remove the muzzle brake, but then you were only allowed to fire with hollow charge and high explosive ammunition. Now, you might ask why? But if you look at the muscle velocities of the different shells, it becomes rather apparent why. The hollow charge has a mere 450 meters per second muscle velocity. High explosive rounds were a bit faster with 550 meters per second, yet the regular armor piercing round already was at 750 meters per second. And the Panzergranate 40, an armor piercing composite rigid projectile had 930 millimeters per second. As such, far higher losses were involved which could damage the recoil system if the muscle brake was not there to compensate for that much power. Now the barrel has a weight of 460 kilogram, which is about one third of the gun, which according to regulation has a weight of 1,500 kilogram, although most secondary sources note the weight at 1425 kilograms. The length of the bell with the muzzle brake is 3.7 meters. The horizontal traverse was 42.5 degrees to the left and to the right, so a total of 65 degrees. In terms of gun depression, it ranged from minus 5 to 22 degrees. The gun shield, as you can see here, consists of two spaced armor plates. According to regulation, they had a thickness of 4.5 millimeters each and as such protected against small arms fire. Let us look behind the gun shield. And here on the left, you see this wheel, which was called Entfernungstrommel, literally distance drum, although temporary US translation is range knob. As you can see down here, there are different shell types noted, like Panzergranate 39 and Granate 34, Panzergranate 40, and another one. As with many museum's pieces, the gun scope is missing. It would be mounted right on top of the range knob, although the regulation mentions that the gun can also be fired without the scope in case of emergency. Now the left crank here, was for changing the gun depression, the right crank is for changing the traverse of the gun. Here you can see the shoulder guard, the gun breech, and the recoil track. And as we move back, here you can see the rather long trace base, which are currently in traveling position. These would be spread out so that these spikes could dig in and prevent the gun from moving backwards while firing. The regulation specifically mentions that firing without them being dug in that the gunner should have a certain distance to the scope. With the space fully deployed, the width was 3.6 meters, whereas the gun in traveling setup had a width of 1.98 meters. One major disadvantage of this gun was its combat weight of 1425 kilograms. 
To put this in perspective, the most common German anti-tank gun at the beginning of the war was the Pak 36 with 37mm and a combat weight of 450kg. This gun could be moved rather easily by its crew and had a good tactical mobility. This was not the case anymore with the Pak 38 with 50mm and a combat weight of around 950kg. This is also addressed in the regulation. The large weight of the gun permits movement in tow by crew only over the shortest possible distance under favorable ground conditions. Careful reconnaissance, skillful guidance by the gunner and determined handling by the operator must ensure rapid and undetected emplacement of the gun. Entering the firing position while being towed by a vehicle must be reconnoitered and prepared. As such, the Geschützeinheit literary gun unit consists of the gun with a proper vehicle. The gun unit consists of the gun and the towing vehicle. The following towing vehicles are used. The light towing vehicle, 3 tons. The half track truck, 2 tons. The medium truck, open. And the Raupenschlepper Ost. 3 to 4 guns form a platoon. Now the crew consists of 8 men, 1 squad or gun leader, six cannoneers and one driver. Note that one of these cannoneers was an MG gunner. The regulation notes that four cannoneers had to be trained on the machine gun. The regulation includes some general principles on the employment of the gun. The armor regulation notes that the gun is capable of destroying enemy tanks at long range, yet it also specifically mentions that the high performance of the gun must not tempt one to open fire too early. Late opening of fire increases the gun's hitting probability and penetration performance and restricts ammunition consumption. As such, it was crucial that during the selection of a firing position that the intended combat distance was taken into account. The regulation specifically mentions the selection of positions that reduce the field of fire of the gun in order to deny the enemy to engage the gun at ranges where it can't effectively respond. Additionally, such a position could also prevent the enemy's other weapons from engaging during the duel between the puck and the enemy tank. Similarly to statements in the German Panzer and especially Jagdpanzer regulations, the employment of single guns was discouraged. As fellow former MG gunner of the Swiss Army always notes, war is a team effort. This is also the reason why I highly recommend to you the various organization videos I have done in the past. The regulation notes, Employment of individual 7.5 cm Pak 40 is to be rejected on principle. Mutual fire support of several tank destroyer guns, Pak combat section must be ensured. It provides the necessary protection for the single gun and guarantees the prospect of success. Finally, a look at penetration values for the regular armor piercing projectile Panzergranate 39 and also the armor piercing composite ratchet projectile. Panzergranate 40. Note that these values are for an impact angle of 30 degree. Be aware that I found several different values and these are not from primary sources. I found only a value for 1000 meter in a primary source and it was lower than that from the secondary source. As such, take these values with a grain of salt. At a range of 100 meter, the penetration is about 106 millimeter with the AP shell and 143 mm with the APCR shell. At 500 meters, these values drop to 96 and 120, and at a range of 1000, the values are 85 and 97 mm, whereas the primary source gives 80 and 85 mm. To put this in perspective, the effective armor thickness of the upper hull of a KV-1S was 76 mm. The Cromwell had 64 mm, the M4A3 Sherman had 72mm, the T34-85 had 90mm and the Panzer IV Ausführung H had 81mm, according to Zaloga. So if these numbers are correct, at 500m the gun could penetrate the upper frontal hull of the various medium tanks with a regular AP shell and even at 1000m this was the case with the exception of the T34-85. Note the turret and mantlet armor thicknesses were sometimes quite different from the hull values. I hope you enjoyed this video on the 75mm Pak 40 here at the Panzer Museum Munster. Big thank you for inviting me. Special thanks to Andrew for reviewing the script and to Fred Benton 
for providing additional terminology on several parts of the gun. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.